Dr. Linzer, I think we can go ahead and get started. That sounds great. Thank awesome. You. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Professional Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability Fall Webinars. Before we begin, we wanted to run through just a couple of housekeeping items. The session will be recorded and will be available after the event. If you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A. We will have time at the end of the webinar to go through many, if not all, of the questions. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Today's speaker is Dr. Mark Linzer, who is the M. Thomas Stillman Endowed Vi Chair and Vice Chief for Education, Mentorship, and Scholarship in the Department of Medicine at Hennepin Healthcare and Professor of Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Today, Dr. Linzer will be presenting on healthcare worker stress and stress management during the pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Linzer. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm going to go ahead and hand our virtual microphone off to you. Thank you so much, Brittany and Bonte and the AMA team for organizing this. And thank you everyone for attending. And there will be places during the presentation and afterwards for conversation. So looking forward to conversation in any way we are able to organize it. Brittany, feel free to begin to advance the slides. So these are our objectives for the day. Hopefully afterwards, you'll be able to identify the components of healthcare worker stress, uh, develop your own list of evidence-based resources, and implement wellness programming at your own institution or clinic. Symptoms of burnout described by Christina Maslach almost 40 years ago were emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a lack of sense of personal accomplishment. One of the models for job stress, uh, and stress is a precursor of burnout. Burnout is a long-term stress reaction. Um, is seen in the demand control model of job stress. This was proposed 40 years ago in the social science literature by Karasek and Johnson and Hall. And we use it and have validated it in doctors and it's valid until today, still useful at we all as workers um, balance demands in our work life by control of the work environment. Stress increases if demands rise or if control diminishes. Then a support can actually facilitate the impact of control. So control and support are our balances for work demands. The bottom line is that support and control moderate stress if demands are high and control or support diminish, stress will rise. So stress during COVID clearly can occur both at work and at home. Uh, the constant change, the work overload, the fear for self, patients and family all contribute to the stress that we feel. So we thought we'd start with just a, an open-ended ability to contribute through the chat or any way that one can. What kind of stresses are you or your colleagues face, facing? Old stresses that are harder now or new ones? Or stresses at work or at home or both that are um, perhaps contributing to you wanting to attend today? And so Brittany, that's a, a question to pause at. Maybe people can answer something in the chat. I don't know if I can see the chat too. Let's see. I see one comment coming up, another comment coming up. Do you see those questions? I Dr. do. And I really appreciate people saying them because they are definitely uh, reflective of what we have seen nationally. Uh, Work-life balance has become so much harder um, with children not being able to go to school regularly and just there's much more to do at both sites. Um, the exhaustion of just the sort of the endlessness 
if you will, of the pandemic. And workload, balancing workload and trying to find time for self and self-care, absolutely critical. And not being able to do everything. Um, we can't do it all. So hopefully we'll be able to give some, some suggestions for some of these. Um, management, personal management and organizational management strategies. So let me know when we get near to the end if we uh, are offering anything which is helpful. I also see isolation at home. Isolation has been a huge issue. And so the last comment, very important, uh, something which has just come up, which is the pent up demand of six months of patients not being seen and now flooding back into the healthcare system. And how do we accommodate for all that has not been done um, without allocating more time per patient and more staff? So definitely um, something that we will be talking about. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, so the Wuhan experience uh, was published in JAMA Network Open several months ago. Um, stress was highest in women healthcare workers, mid-career clinicians, nursing, and frontline healthcare workers. Uh, in our own work with the AMA, we have been uh, measuring coping with COVID um, from April. So we've seen almost 40,000 responses now and we've analyzed data on the first 20,000. We used a brief uh, questionnaire. Um, <laughs> it's easy to administer, rapid turnaround, applicable to all team members. So physicians, nurses, advanced practice providers, uh, housekeeping, food service, administrative, everybody. Um, and it was administered by a team from the AMA, from Hennepin, and from a wonderful data management group called Forward Health Group in Madison, Wisconsin. Next one. So in the first 10 or 20,000 respondents, we've seen a wide range of stress between organizations. Um, and also in terms of when people are surveyed, um, where they are in terms of the surge, um, and then in terms of their own adapting to caring for COVID. So what might have been extraordinarily stressful um, in April and May is demanding in a very different way in June and July. But the issues involved workload, and these are our, our key factors that are involved in a stress score that we put together. Workload, mental health concerns, um, the particular role uh, that we serve. And um, another factor that's come in has been feeling valued by the organization, which can attenuate stress. So some of the things you all mentioned, particularly workload, uh, definitely matters in terms of the stress that we're all feeling nationally. So the AMA has put out several uh, documents about caring for healthcare workers during the crisis. And they have a before, during, and after. Uh, so before, see if you can have a chief wellness officer and a well-being infrastructure. We have found during our approach here at Hannah Benna Safety Net Hospital in Minneapolis that having a wellness committee and wellness champions has been essential. Uh, probably the most important thing that we've utilized. Create a caring for healthcare worker plan so it's not just reactive, but um, proactive. And have leaders um, available in the hospital, um, visible virtually and even in real time. Um, I spent a lot of time attending on the wards, uh, being in the clinic, even just being around everybody else who's there, even when the patients weren't coming was, felt very meaningful as a way of saying that we are all in this together. During the crisis, and one may consider this to still be during, um, measuring stress, uh, developing a support structure for managing the stress, 
and then reassessing stress and adapting the plan. So we're gonna talk about the Rush University program soon. And then after, and I, I put in between peaks. So, you know, there are second waves and second parts of first waves and, but there seem to be dips. And so take advantage of those dips um, to debrief the units, to catalog the wellness lessons learned, what worked, um, and then make sure there's a lot of time for dedications, memorials, and celebrating successes. We've had people who have left the ICU after 60 days of, of intubation or ECMO, and um, it's been a huge uplift to, um, to watch them get better. Okay. This is an article we wrote really very close to the beginning of the pandemic um, in the annals um, and talked about some of the things that one could do in terms of uh, having a wellness command center, healthy food and snacks that we stocked for all of our workers day and night, um, mental health support with a warm line uh, staffed by our psychiatry and psychology departments, um, child care resources, exercise resources virtually available, um, just paying attention to the, to the, whatever one can do to make the providers know that they're, they're able to have some semblance of a normal life in the midst of all of this. There were a couple of articles in the annals last week, mental health treatment for frontline clinicians during the pandemic and when the dust settles, preventing a mental health crisis, both excellent. Um, there's an article in JAMA last week by Christine Olson, Tate Shanafelt, about post-pandemic growth, um, also superb. So there's a lot of good resources um, available and, and very helpful. So as mentioned, some of the things that we did, we set up the warm line with our psychologists um, right at the beginning. and. Um, People could call that line 24 seven, leave a message and somebody would get back to them within I think, 10 to 12 hours. We had our wellness command center in a uh, provider dining and wellness area. Um, we started a buddy program recently and um, that's been a spectacular thing to do. It's based on a program that is over at the University of Minnesota, comes from the military, the battle buddy program everybody gets paired up so that no one's left behind. And then there's a wellness infrastructure that oversees the buddy pairs. Um, the AMA has put out a variety of wonderful suggestions about PPE, childcare, food and water, lodging, peer support, and self-care. So all of these are available through the AMA and, and definitely worth taking advantage of as this goes on for a long time. This was a great article in uh, the NEJM Catalyst about creating wellness in a pandemic, a practical framework, um, which I learned a lot from reading just a couple of months ago. And this may well have been the Rush article with four strategies, um, which they started by saying the impact of COVID on frontline workers is yet to be fully understood. And that's true. Um, while we still have to really be paying attention, we have to be present and we have to be listening. Um, some of the things you all spoke about in the early question session disaster models predict disillusionment, exhaustion, PTSD, substance use particularly after the adrenaline and the camaraderie of the early days fade. And that is something to watch for during these dips now. There may be less COVID, but there's also less adrenaline. And so we need each other and we need some strategies. So Rush has done uh, some pretty spectacular things, I think. Wellness rounds on high impact units in the afternoons, a wellness response team with an algorithm for escalation on the Teams platform um, with a physician, an RN, psychologist, uh, licensed social worker, chaplain, 
And this is all connected to executive leadership, which we also find is crucial. Um, mental health protection, wellness plus for individuals at risk. So it's important to have a mechanism to allow people to identify and then to work with people who are having difficulties um, to help them get through. Mental wellness resource hub uh, with wellness rooms, uh, access to phone calls, um, 30 calls a day they had coming in. So that was really spectacular. Sometimes you will find when you organize these things, you set it up, you get excited about it, and then people don't call. And there was an article in the Star Tribune a couple of weeks ago from the military that, that said they had the same programs in the military and people didn't want to talk about it. People don't like to talk about being stressed. It's, it's a culture change to acknowledge it. And so we have to work on changing the culture um, and it takes time and persistence and believing that you're on the right track in doing these things. So we just talked about some of the hurdles, stigma, integrating wellness into a busy daily life, um, assessing the impact of what's working. <clears throat> some of their themes are converting I'm fine into a real discussion. So I find when I go places in the hallway, I leave more time to get there so I can stop along the way and have a conversation with someone that's more than how are you doing. And it often focuses on moral distress, about deaths and resource scarcity, safety, finance, family life, mental health and stigma and powerlessness. So there's a lot of feelings out there. And I do find that if just given a little bit of time, people will share amazing things. Um, that they might not have shared before. There's a great article by Schreiber about the military, about maximizing resilience of healthcare workers. Um, people could work on their personal resilience plans. I think this is one of those times when resilience really does matter. This is going on for a long time. People need a, a, their own strategy for sustaining and bouncing back multiple times. Uh, one that's out there is the APD strategy, anticipate, plan, deter. So anticipate, understand your own stress reactions even before you get to COVID. Plan, defining whatever your stressors are, your coping plan and your supports, and deter. Activate your coping plan when, when the stress happens. Listen, protect, connect with other people. Um, and it's interesting, people don't necessarily articulate these steps to themselves ahead of time. And yet, this is definitely the time to have a personal strategy. So there was this marvelous uh, stress management kit um, from Canada that I thought was one of the best things I read in preparing for this webinar. Psychological Fitness by Joe Nice. Psychological First Aid for Frontline Healthcare Workers during COVID. I'm just gonna read some of you, some of the things from it that, that caught my eye. Taking care of yourself is not selfish, but an act of kindness towards all who depend on you. Reactions are not linear or static. Some of the strategies, watch less news. I really have to make myself not look at the news it's hard, but I don't find that it makes me feel much better when I do it uh, by looking and I, I do feel better when I don't. So, you know, watch less. Protect your non-COVID times and your activities so you definitely can recharge. That's very important. It is uh, a lot of people are putting their head down and trying to just work through it until it's over. That is definitely not the strategy any longer that this has gone on so many months. Um, like for anything else, periodic breaks and support are necessary for recharging. But information overload, I've never seen more things come to my email per day ever. That seemed important, but the question is, do you need this to do your job today? And if not, save it, store it, file it, bookmark it, but only read the things you have to do when you're really being stressed by the overload. Um, 
and sort of one thing that can happen when there's so much information is are you finding yourself on autopilot, not being mindful? And then just tuning in periodically to senses, taste, color, smell. Uh, I got to go for a long run this morning by the lakes and the trees were exceptionally gorgeous. And I just tried to make sure that I looked at them. Those leaves are not gonna be there that long. And I want to tune in to those senses. Uh, another one is avoid perfectionism. Don't hold yourself to the same standards during a pandemic that you might at other times. Um, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, more from Jonis. Postpone your worries. I like this idea. It's tempting that things keep bombarding you to worry about. And they're legitimate things to worry about. On the other hand, there's probably not much value in worrying um, every half hour all day long, and certainly no value in it at night. And so set aside some of your worries for worry time. Uh, 15 minutes every day or every other day, you know, you're going to take your worries and that's when you're going to worry and then you're going to stop. So try and compartmentalize a little bit. Pay attention to and nurture relationships. Um, another one that I like to do is uh, when arriving at work, I learned this one from her, spend two minutes in conversation with a coworker. Instead of just walking by somebody, just stop and, and say a little bit of a more detailed hello and listen and connect. Um, and then like the buddy program, schedule peer check-ins. So time when you're going to talk to people, just make sure to get those check-ins there particularly in times of isolation, they're just necessary. Uh, a big one that's been successful for organizations that we've worked with is expressing gratitude, letting others know that your contribution is important, that you matter no matter what your role, and thanking people for their work and commitment. Clearly people on the front lines are having extraordinary stress and everybody who's contributing has their own stressors that can be quite high. Um, if you're home, working from home with children at home and you're doing in-basket work and calling patients and doing research or whatever your contribution, you could be working double and triple time. That's still stressful. So letting everybody know that they are appreciated and valued um, is very important right now, maybe more important than ever. And then I liked her, you got this, we are in this together. So what have your clinics or institutions been doing to address some of, some of these challenges? Are people willing to share what they found helpful? Let's see if I can click on the chat. Can you see the comments, Dr. Linzer? I've got three comments here from Kira, who is sending them presumably from others. So are you in the chat or the q and I have some in the chat as well. Ah, I'm in q and Let's see if I can find a way to chat. Ah. Investment in leadership. Keeping up to date on new information, health systems, do more, see patients, yes. Dr. Flinzer, I do want to remind you that all attendees can't read what is being said in the chat. So oh, it's can't. helpful. No, yeah, so it's helpful that you're reading them out loud. Okay. Well, I'm, I really resonate uh, Lisa McLean, thank you so much for your comments. I really resonate with investing in leadership. Um, that's a really great comment because leaders right now, they're always 
under stress, but it, it is just so stressful right now in being a leader. And so not just acknowledging that stress, but actually investing in the leaders, giving them tools for leading and teaching psychological first aid, that is excellent. So thank you for that one. Sharing the information here with others. Yeah, I find that people are just hungry for information about what, what works, um, what can we do, um, and that wellness matters. And so sharing it and that there's a way to assess it and address it. And then Maria Kusser, regular communication during the pandemic, both via email and regular virtual meetings. I think that's great also, Maria. Um, I find that we get lots of information about, you know, when to get checked and how to use the PPE and when the visitors can come and, or cannot come, but we don't get a lot of communication about taking care of ourselves. And regular communication about that is essential. Well, I appreciate attending this webinar being helpful anytime. Here's an intervention from Lisa at, Lisa, maybe you can tell us where, where you are at. This sounds spectacular. An intervention called the Peer Processing Groups, co-led by mental health professionals and a clinical lead, processing being vulnerable, post-traumatic growth, and then connecting with resources. That sounds great. It's terrific. Henry Ford, it's spectacular. Um, we need more to help our peers to reduce the stress. I agree. Um, you know, I really, what I found in doing this, so I mean, I, I drew it on my whiteboard several months ago, our mental health protection program. And after a while, it just got to be all this swirl of arrows and, and goals and ideas and resources. And you're absolutely right. We do need more to help our peers reduce the stress, but you know, it really is a journey and just taking this journey step by step, each step really matters. Well, I learned something yesterday, which was the journey is as important as the destination. We spend our days saying, if I can just get all this done, I'll reach my destination, but the journey is so important. And so that journey in helping people reduce stress is very important and each step is important and not every step is going to be successful but taking them is crucial so the provider lounge uh and dining area um we've done we built that a few years ago with philanthropy from the clinicians and um has a little workout area and then it's got a nice um carpet for meditation and for sitting down and tables that can be wheeled out of the way so you can do Tai Chi or have lunch. Um, and then during the pandemic, we actually would make daily weekly runs to Costco and pick up snack bars, healthy snacks and coffee and waters and um, other things that people could get any time of the day or night. Um, it was very small what we contributed. Um, we mainly paid for it through some of our um, funds in our wellness committee, which were rapidly depleted, but it was a wonderful thing. People just really felt valued um, over and above the value of the snack bars. Um, we even got some companies to donate some snack bars, which was great, which is great. Um, uh, I do think that we will have um, mental health and PTSD issues emerging. And I've been talking about this for some time now at my institution and elsewhere, which is why it's been so important for our group, our wellness team to be proactive. I think there's been a lot of proactive activity though. And so I'm cautiously optimistic that the workforce is not necessarily gonna decline and that people are still gonna be able to work. Um, 
I just think we need to do what your questions are all focusing on is we need to build the infrastructures for supporting ourselves and the organizations need to be part of that support. Um, so we have a wellness committee and we have an office of professional work life and those committees uh, report to the office of the medical staff and the medical executive committee. So one thing I would say is you want to be on the organizational chart. You want to belong to the organizational structure um, and have somebody above you who's an executive leader, who's a partner and watching over this. Comfort cart. Spectacular. Connect and give info. Yeah, it's wonderful. Being visible is really important. Totally agree, Lisa. That's great. It's just great. All right, let's see. Um, Brittany, are there more slides or what have we got? So how can we stay in community and help each other? So this is an idea from some of our other work. Uh, Sarah and I have worked with the ACP, American College Physicians for years and um, now working with IHI as well. And, um, we find staying in community is really important. And so we have listservs and conference calls and a Teams file and totally open to other suggestions for being a learning or a support community. It goes back to your questions about how do we get through this. Um, and it's by continuing to listen to each other and teach each other because things keep evolving. So Brittany, I'll just put that out there for, for us in the AMA to think about is how, how, how can we provide ongoing support for people who want to stay connected. Okay, so I think it's okay to do questions yeah. now if we want. Thank you, Dr. Linzer. I just have a couple of slides that I want to run through before we go into the Q&A. Of course. For additional resources to support your physicians and staff during this time, uh, please visit the American Medical Association website. We thank you all for your time today and hope that you're able to join our next scheduled webinar, which is this Thursday, October 14th at 1 p.m. Central Time. This Thursday, we will feature Dr. Suja Matthew, who will present on leading through a crisis communication during COVID times. For any general questions, comments, uh, please email the Action Labs um, email inbox, which is action.labs at ama-assn.org. And then finally, after concluding this webinar, you will have the opportunity to participate in a brief four question survey we ask participants to please take two, two minutes to fill out the anonymous survey. Your feedback is important to us as we continue to develop future programming. So now we can go ahead and go into the Q&A, um, Dr. Linzer. We will read the questions off to you um, so that you can focus on responding. Um, let's see here. The first question that we have is, do you know of any tools to promote dialogue, especially in regards to personal experiences in a sometimes awkward online environment? Again, that's a great question. Promoting dialogue in the online environment. I don't know of any tools for that. There may well be many. I just don't know of them. Whitney, I don't know if you know some. Um, we can follow up with any attendees, with any questions, Dr. Linzer, that you're unable to answer. We're happy to provide follow-up um, responses to them. So that's one of them that I'll flag. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. Uh, Dr. Linzer, the next question is, do you have any advice for systems that may just now be measuring well-being for the very first time? Examples are leadership buy-in, et cetera. It is definitely a journey. Um, we've been doing it for seven years here at Hennepin, and I think somewhere between year four and five, it finally kicked in with the, you know, the organizational leaders, the chairs, the departments, and everybody sort of finally got it. Um, and in previous years, you would have sessions where we each year break down the data by department and meet with the department chairs. And, and they sort of look at it and say, I think I get it you know, my group's having trouble or it's not having trouble or this is working, that's not working. And then, and then after a while they'd say, this is pretty good stuff. So 
it is definitely a journey. It's not instant um, where you get data, you look at it and go, oh my goodness, now I know exactly what to do and what's wrong. Um, so I would say um, rely on partners about how to portray it in the easiest way to understand and, um, and then seek advice along the way of, of how to disseminate. It's definitely for dissemination, um, but it's, um, there are some tricks about how to do so. This is a really good follow-up question. So this question is survey data can be really overwhelming, especially for organizations that have never formally surveyed before. If an organization surveys for the first time during COVID to measure well-being, how can they start to begin to wrap their heads around their data so that they can find tangible interventions? It can be really hard to avoid boiling the ocean when you're given so much data to work with. Yeah, well, that's true, very true. Um, in some ways, I would say we try not to overwhelm people with data when we, when we measure. We want to measure only what you need and then only get the data and the analyses that you want to use um we've had many sessions where we meet with organizational leaders about their data and try and help get one's arms around what the data show um usually the data will tell a story a few stories and the trick is can, can, can you see those few trees through the forest and tell you sort of where to point the compass and then what are the evidence-based interventions that would help and so again, I would rely on those who have been through that forest before the first couple of times and try not to ask for too much data. Uh, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. The next question, thank you for that, Dr. Linzer. The next question is, uh, we have been hearing there will likely be a forthcoming and more severe mental health crises among physicians and healthcare workers as a result of the prolonged response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you speak to how health systems may be able to get ahead of this? Um, what can be done to prevent existing burnout to turning into severe PTSD or other mental health issues? I think a lot of the things we're talking about today are, are relevant. Um, building the infrastructure, when we look at back at what has worked, it's having a, a, a backbone of wellness champions in every department throughout the institution so that all thousand providers are tended to. Um, we don't necessarily get to every single one, but we have somebody who's responsible for everybody. So there's nobody out there that nobody knows about. Um, so building an infrastructure, measuring how you're doing, um, doing some of the things that we talked about today, both at an individual level and an organizational level, measuring again. We're actually um, working right now on an app that can be used on the phone so that at the end of each day, someone can just text in, had a bad day, had a good day. Um, and then you can map out your hospital, your clinic or organization, and where the hot spots, where the problem, or who needs me. Um, so, you know, making measurement real time would be the ultimate goal. Um, you just spoke on measurement, so I think this is a good follow-up question. Um, do you recommend that organizations transparently share their survey results with the broader organization? Yeah, we always do. We do a wellness survey every year with a mini Z. And we just looked yesterday at our one page summary uh, the front has some figures that are showing success with smiles about the things that are better and some thoughtful looks about the things that are not better. On the back, we've got the data for the last three years lined up, including this year's results with red, yellow, green. Very easy to see. Everybody who's filled in the survey gets the results every year within a couple of weeks of when they do it. And so when people know that they're going to see the survey results and that people are going to pay attention to them, they fill them in. So our response rates have always been between 60 and 70 percent. So Great. yes, share. Thank you. Do you know of any healthcare organizations that are sponsoring group mindful self-compassion practices? 
I know there are. I don't know anyone in particular that I can point to, but I would say that that's a, a very important step as well. There's a long-standing debate in the literature about burnout prevention, whether organizational change or individual interventions are better. Um, the data support that organizational change is probably more effective for many reasons. However, this is big enough and hard enough that I think it takes everything we've got. And so it's going to take some individual mindfulness-based practices as well as some organizational change. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Dr. Linzer. Um, unless any others come in, we, this is our last question. Um, what's the balance between individual resiliency and system support? Um, how can my organization stress both individual resiliency during this time without blaming the victim? That is the long-standing question, and it's more powerful now than ever, but um, my mantra has always been, it's probably three times more effective to change the organization than it is to try and change for all of us to change ourselves. On the other hand, as an individual, I can't change my organization, so if I can do something that's going to make things better for me so I can sustain, I'll do it. So... In this case, you know, we're all victims of the pandemic, but no one's to blame for that. Um, there's no blame. Just everything works. If you look at in the literature, the individual mindfulness-based training, it, it's effective. Organizational change, the things that we've done with randomized trials and work-life interventions, they're effective. So they all work. So there's no reason not to do both um, would be my answer. Great to know. We do have one last question. Um, are there research focus areas that you would identify for researchers looking to contribute to the literature on well being, specifically during COVID? Well, I would, based on your questions that you've just summarized so well and all you have given me. I think these questions um, merit study in addition to my being able to try to respond it would be better to have data about them. So which interventions really work the best? Um, can we ward off uh, large numbers of PTSD um, providers? Um, which healthcare roles are at the most risk? Um, which kinds of workers are at the highest risk and how can we help them? Um, I think there's a lot to learn and the, the more we can learn it um, scientifically, instead of just by our impressions, the better. We did have another question come up. Um, it says, what do you think or know is the greatest protective aspect against burnout, especially during COVID? So far we've been beginning to see signs in survey data locally and nationally that um, feeling valued by the organization is protective. Um, and we've seen some signs that the enhanced sense of meaning and purpose that people feel during this time is also protective. Um, so this year for the first time at Hennepin, we actually measured feeling valued. How much do you feel valued by the organization? Um, and, and to me, that's an opportunity it's not 100% anywhere. And what would it take to make people feel value? And I think that a lot of the value goes where the COVID is. Um, but there's a whole lot of other workers who are not right there. Um, who need that value too. So there's some opportunities there in terms of um, expressing gratitude and value. Thank you, Dr. Lenzer. It looks like that was the last question. So um, that closes the Q&A portion of this webinar. Dr. Linzer, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. We really appreciate it. Um, to all of our participants, thank you so much for your time and we hope to see you join um, one of our next upcoming webinars. Thank you all, have a great day. Thank you.